Good evening, everyone. My name is Kathy Pierce, and I'm the Director of Programs at the American Nutrition Association, the ANA. The ANA would like to thank Bragg Health Foundation for their support of our 2018 Global Webinar Series. Learn more about their mission to inspire and educate people to adopt a healthy lifestyle through optimal nutrition, exercise, positive attitudes, and spiritual wellness at BraggHealth.org. The American Nutrition Association is very pleased to be hosting Dr. Russell Jaffe tonight to discuss functional immunology, the microbiome, and metabolomics. Let me take just a moment to tell our audience about the ANA. We're a nonprofit organization which for over 40 years has been on a mission to promote optimal health through nutrition and wellness education. We educate the public and professionals in many ways, including hosting world-class nutrition programs such as this one tonight. We encourage all of you listening this evening to visit our website, theana.org, for an abundance of nutrition information, resources, and upcoming webinars. Join the ANA as a member and help us continue to bring these nutrition luminaries to you. The ANA would like to thank Now Foods for providing the technical assistance that allows us to present our webinar series. Find them at nowfoods.com. And now we are honored to introduce Dr. Russell Jaffe. Dr. Jaffe received his BS, MD, and PhD from the Boston University School of Medicine in 1972. He completed residency training in clinical chemistry at the National Institutes of Health. He is board certified in clinical pathology and in chemical pathology. For the last 30 years, Dr. Jaffe has advocated a system that treats people, not diagnoses, cause, not consequence, and promotes long-term sustainable solutions as an alternative to a system dominated by prescriptive symptom suppressive solutions. Dr. Jaffe's cumulative experience enabled him to take his efforts one step further and build PERC, Integrative Health. He currently serves on the American Board of Clinical Metal Toxicology and coordinates its certification training program. Dr. Jaffe is the recipient of the Merck, Sharp, and Dom Excellence in Research Award, the J.D. Lane Award, and the U.S. PHS Meritorious Service Award. He teaches and lectures widely on nutritional immunology and treatment guidelines for chronic autoimmune and immune dysfunction syndromes and has helped elucidate the causes and consequences of immune defense and repair functions in health and disease. Welcome, Dr. Jaffe. We are so honored to have you with us this evening. Thank you. It's good to be back, and thanks for that kind introduction. And just for full disclosure, I have passed the baton to others in regard to the Board of Metal Toxicology, but I have taken on some other responsibilities in terms of speeding the transition from sick care to health care. And it is a privilege to be with you for the next few minutes where we're going to review functional immunology and the microbiome and the metabolome. Now, the microbiome is mostly about digestion, and the metabolome is mostly about metabolism, but the in vogue term of the day is microbiome and metabolome, and you get paid a little bit more for saying that than digestion and metabolism. Um, as you can see from the part of the slide on the right, I maintain a fellow's status in six different organizations. I'm a senior fellow at the Health Studies Collegium. I had the privilege of founding Perk Integrative Health, ELISA Act Biotechnologies, and ARMJ HRX. And I think from that you can conclude that either I have a Jewish mother or I'm easily bored, or, or maybe both. But what I really want us to share today is about functional immunology. Not about red and blue and dead, not about physical chemistry, but about dynamic responses of cells in culture that give us information we could not otherwise get. So what we're talking about is the immune system. The immune system is the immune defense and repair system. It is an amplified response to any foreign invader. And now we rather quickly get to inflammation, which we suggest needs to be reframed and understood more accurately at the cause level, because the cause of the problem is repair deficit. The consequence is inflammation, which many clinicians believe is something to be fought, 
but we find repair deficit an opportunity to induce repair, to correct deficits, to reduce toxic burden, to enable the mind and body to communicate more effectively. And now we get to delayed hypersensitivities, which are acquired, amplified immune reactions to things we eat, and that becomes important. And now on the bottom of the slide, you see about proactive primary prevention. And sometimes the way I say it is that we want proactive, predictive, personalized primary prevention practices. For those who were following, that's an onomatopoeia of six consecutive Ps, and it means that we have a comprehensive, rather evidence-based and in-practice test biological detoxification system, and we want the immune system to restore tolerance and induce repair, rather than fighting with the consequences of either inflammation or autoimmunity. And so it gets back quickly to what is the basis for the ANA, what we eat, drink, think, and do. Personalized, lifestyle repair-driven programs that save lives, actually a million a year, can save up to a million lives lost today at high cost and a lot of suffering unnecessarily. So let's get into the essentials. And the essentials with regard to the microbiome or the digestion, the microbiome, the intestinal tract, we have to look at prebiotics, probiotics, and symbiotics. With regard to prebiotics, we want 40 to 100 grams a day of unprocessed fiber. This means either a diet where you have to chew a bunch or where you add fiber to your diet so that peristalsis and healthy digestion and nourishment of healthy uh, intestinal flora can take place. In addition, you want probiotics. You want live, good probiotic bugs, 40 to 100 billion a day, either from uh, fermented foods or from supplements, with the emphasis on live, not on colony count. So there are probiotics that have many bugs that are dead, and then there are probiotics that have bugs that are alive. And I suggest you make sure that the colony forming units, the CFU, be between 40 and 100 billion per day at the time you consume the probiotic. And if I say that in a much simpler way, can you make yogurt overnight out of your probiotic? If you can, it's alive. If you can't, it's dead. And I recommend live rather than dead. I recommend probiotics that can produce yogurt if you wanted to make your own lassi or yogurt. And notice on the bottom, the third part of the microbiome essentials are symbiotics, recycled glutamine. Glutamine is an essential amino acid that energizes and repairs the intestinal lining where energy is needed faster than any other part of the body, where it's more vulnerable than any other part of the body. The problem is, if you give a lot of glutamine, you could build up something called glutamate. You don't want to do that. So we figured out years ago how to recycle glutamine. So you can give 1.5 to 6 grams a day of recycled glutamine and get the equivalent benefit of 15 to 60 grams of pure glutamine, but without the risk of glutamate buildup. So we want the benefit. We want to reduce the risk. Prebiotics, probiotics, and symbiotics are your friends. Why? Because you want your immune system to be balanced. You want to have the ability to defend against foreign invasion and repair. Maybe do more defense during the day and more repair at night. And then you don't want to have a lot of hypersensitivities hanging around. Now, this is about celiac enteropathy, and it's got a lot of details, and I 
uh, encourage you to look at what this says, because at the end of the discussion, at the end of understanding this, it's the interaction between your innate response, which is on the right of the slide as you see it, the adaptive response on the left as you see it, and how the mucins and the secretory IgA, how the elective protective digestive molecules prevent harm from coming in. But when you don't have a healthy diet, when you don't have enough prebiotic fiber, when you don't have enough probiotic organisms, when you don't have enough recycled glutamine, then your innate immune responses eventually become overwhelmed and you shift towards dependence on the adaptive immune system, which is hypersensitive, it's very amplified in its reaction, it's very powerful, and it induces um, autoimmunity, which is exactly what you don't want. So let's look at celiac gluten wheat sensitivity, because it's absolutely in vogue to be gluten-free, whatever that means. To me, that means no grains at all, because all grains have gluten, and all grasses do not. So if you want to strengthen your digestion, eat a lot of grasses and avoid all, all grains until your digestion is strong enough to break them down to the building blocks that make them the staff of life again. Now, with regard to celiac syndrome and or disease, if you have enough impaired digestion, if you have enough low stomach acid, that therefore you're not stimulating digestive juices and digestive enzymes and bile to flow from the liver, and therefore you have diarrhea, failure to thrive, loss of elective protective molecules, now you must get in and quickly determine what the probability is of, a, of an issue and you might look at the TTG, the transglutaminase. You might look at the SIGA, the SIGA, the secretory IGA um, molecule. And you can look at that in the saliva. You can look at that in the blood. You might do an endoscopy. You might even do a biopsy. Jerry Trier says if you want to diagnose, and, and Sheila Sherlock agreed with him, if you want to properly diagnose celiac disease, you must do a biopsy of the small intestine and do the ultrastructure, the electron microscopy. Because a lot of people have poor digestion, not to be confused with celiac syndrome, and then there are the people who really have celiac syndrome, not to be confused with the people who have digestive impairment. So what is celiac syndrome? It's known as sprue. There's a tropical part of sprue and a non-tropical part of sprue. The incidence in the last 50 years has not changed. The awareness has dramatically changed. But in 2004, after 50 years of monitoring, the National Institutes of Health Consensus Development Conference on Celiac Disease concluded that the incidence has been unchanged for true celiac disease for the last 50 years. However, more and more people have maldigestion, poor digestion, impaired digestion. And that's a different celiac light, like problem, but it's not celiac light, and it's not celiac kinda. It's not celiac. It is a maldigestion as opposed to the autoimmunity of true celiac syndrome known as SPRU. Now, SPRU is 80%, in my experience, 80% due to wheat or related gluten, gliadin, or antigens, and 20% related to other grain products. So if you just avoid all grains, you can help those disposed to celiac syndrome, or more importantly, those who have di weak digestion uh, due to the complexity of modern grains being digested. Now, when you go to test, you can get very confused very quickly because if you look for antibodies against IgG, as this slide represents. You can find them in a lot of people, but most of them are beneficial and neutralizing and helpful, and very few of them are harmful. But if you assume that all antibodies are harmful, then you get confused clinically. And if you assume all antibodies are harmful, then you don't remember about infectious diseases of childhood. Because when children have infectious diseases and they recover, as they routinely do, their immune system remembers 
and has a protective neutralizing antibody, an IgG antibody that is protective and neutralizing and helpful. So we have to understand functional immunology if we're going to understand these issues of digestion and metabolism, of immune defense and repair, and, and of nature, nurture, and wholeness properly applied uh, to improve outcomes. Now, with regard to serology, I want to emphasize how confusing IgG testing is. And here's an article on celiac disease pathophysiology by Kupfer and Jabri. And what they concluded was that if you do conventional physical chemistry, serology, you will get confused and have bad, bad results, poor outcomes. How about glutens and grains? Well, you have the family, the subfamily, the tribe, the grain, and then the subspecies. Uh, and what you notice is that all grains have glutens. All grains have glutens. If you want to avoid all glutens because they're harder to digest and they make for breads and other things that are sticky, if you want to avoid all glutens, then avoid all grains. And that's not hard because there are lots of grasses and beans and lentils and other healthy foods to eat. But please understand that if you want to be, quote, gluten-free, you must avoid all of the grains, not just wheat. Wheat, rye, barley, oats, any of the grains, any of the cross mixes, if they're grains, they have gluten. If they are not grains, if they're grasses, they don't. So celiac disease is something that we, with the lymphocyte response assay, the LRA, the lymphocyte response assay, a functional ex vivo cell culture, the LRA distinguishes helpful from harmful antibody responses. And so if you want to look at the histology of, say, stomach biopsies, if you want to look at the duodenal biopsies and look at the villi or the atrophy of the digestive surface that occurs in people with digestive problems, including celiac, but including all digestive problems, you then end up with nonspecific symptoms frequently that lead to delayed or misdiagnosis, and this is increasingly common and unfortunate. So, celiac syndrome. 80% due to gluten and gliadin from wheat, 20% due to other antigens, almost all from grains. So if you want to manage celiac risk, avoid all grains and eat lots of grasses and other healthier foods. So serology antibody tests are just unhelpful because they could be meaningful, neutralizing, and beneficial, or they could be complement fixing and provocative uh, and harmful. And just measuring IgG, however you measure IgG, there's no way to measure IgG that's functional. You have to do a cell culture to get meaningful cell responses. When you do physical chemistry, which was good in the 19th and early 20th century, you can measure and quantify IgG, but you don't know whether it's helpful or harmful, and therefore, from my point of view, it's confusing. You need to know whether this is a helpful antibody or a harmful antibody. Just to review very quickly, the adaptive immune system has a natural part that's passive and actively induced, either in the womb, passive from the mom, or by infection and response. And then there's the artificial, which is passive antibody transfer uh, used in therapy or active immunization. So we have an adaptive immune system. We want to understand that. And here we briefly review both the adaptive, both sides of the adaptive immune system. So you start with the antibody mediated on the right. You see that's B cell related and it goes down to plasma cells. B cells live on average about six months or so, but plasma cells live for your lifetime, and so you have memory B cells that remember any foreign invasion. And then, more interestingly, on the left, you see cell-mediated adaptive immune responses. T cells, Th1, Th2, cells that respond, they're lymphocytes, but they respond without antibodies. And so T cells know where to go, they're drawn into the places where repair is needed. Antigen stimulation induces them to proliferate. There are helper versions and 
and suppressor versions known as cytotoxic. There are memory T cells. This is your anti-cancer mechanism. It's kind of important to keep an anti-cancer mechanism operating, and I want mine to live as long as I do. And in regard to the innate immune system, there are microbiomes throughout the body. So the microbiome of your skin or your nose, of your mouth or your lungs, of your GI tract or whatever, they're each a little different. What we want is a balanced immune response able to defend and repair in good proportion. Because immune system tolerance is really important, and delayed allergies cost. When you have seasonal or delayed allergies, this means impairment of function. Quality of life goes down. Restorative sleep is impaired. Hormonal imbalances emerge. Digestive and immunologic responses are also altered. So there are lots of costs from delayed allergies that causes a loss of tolerance, a break in tolerance, as we say in the immunology field. So what did we set out to do in regard to the lymphocyte response assay breakthrough? What we wanted to do was measure all of the delayed responses in ways that were uniquely functional, predictive, powerful in terms of their accuracy, and would discover any harmful but not helpful antibodies, any harmful immune complexes, any T cell adaptation responses, because it takes three hours to three weeks in the body from exposure to expression. And if it takes three hours to three weeks to process the foreign material and then present it to the immune system so that the immune system can react, the most perfect history, the most perfect uh, questionnaire will not determine things that happened days, weeks ago. So we realized we had to do an ex vivo lymphocyte response assay based on my prior work in uh, platelets and coagulation and predicting atherosclerosis. We moved on to the immune system and we developed the ex vivo lymphocyte response assay. This is less than 3% variance on 4,000 plus blind split samples because people said, gee, how accurate can it be to measure actual cell responses? Well, we're more accurate in blind split samples in predicting lymphocyte response than most physical chemistry. And certainly the other in vitro, which means test tube, not in the body, uh, testing, whether it be antibodies like IgG or serology tests, whether it's particle size tests, whether it's cytokine release tests, they all have the dilemma of being in vitro. None of them are ex vivo. And we're very sure after 30 plus years of doing now, I think over 80,000 tests and 25 million cell cultures, uh, that delayed allergy is very common in people who have autoimmune or inflammatory conditions. And the way to get at the um, solution is to have an ex vivo assay that you marry with healthy nutrition, healthy lifestyle, and substitution comprehensively for the foods, chemicals, or medicines that are inducing hypersensitivity for that individual. And here you see a picture in the lower right of one of our senior technologists actually looking at the LRA, the lymphocyte response assay, by ELISA ACT. This is an advanced cell technique as well as an amplified procedure. It is ex vivo. It does measure all three delayed pathways concurrently. It is an advanced method with very few false positives and very few variances, less than 3% on blind splits over years and years. So when people say, gee, it's too hard to do a cell culture, what it means is it's too hard for them to do a cell culture. But we pioneered much of this technology. We had to develop some original science, which is uh, patented. And we've been applying it in clinical outcome studies uh, for decades finding superior results when you're more comprehensive about what is burdening a person and you marry that to a functional nutrition plan and a healthy habits or lifestyle plan that allows them uh, to return to good digestive and metabolic health. Here you see pictures under the microscope as our technologists see them. On the left, non-reactive. On the right, reactive. I hope you can see that on the right is different than on the left. 
And I only include this slide because uh, some companies will say to you, oh, it's so hard to do a cell response assay. You can't tell the differences. It's very fuzzy. Well, what I hope you can see on the left, those are non-reactive cells. On the right, you see those halos. Those are the reactive cells. We've been looking at this for many decades and um, are utterly confident uh, that because of the blind splits that I send in myself, that other people send in that we don't know about, that we're very accurate, and then we put ourselves to the test in outcome studies to make sure that this is predictive. So on an ounce of blood, you can do, if you want, maybe 500 different substances. We have the largest number of foods additives and preservatives or environmental chemicals. We also have 14 toxic metals, medications, molds, danders, hair, feathers, and herbs, and we purify all of our own antigens. We coat them on the microtiter plate where the reaction happens, and then we use the um, gently spun, let's call cell-rich plasma, to do the reaction. And the result is either three or six months substitution as best you can while we correct nutritional deficits, while we initiate biological detoxification, while we alkalinize and enhance and evoke human healing responses. We include a personalized health appraisal questionnaire, which, when it's filled out, gives us additional information so that we can be even more specific about, in addition to substituting for the items reactive on the LRA test, where are there hidden places where you might find these substances? And what supplements and or activities or attitudes would help speed the healing so that you can restore competence to digestion and metabolic uh, abilities. I do want to mention leaky gut because it is very much uh, a problem today. A healthy digestive lining has much surface area. In fact, it's estimated that a healthy digestive tract in a human adult would spread out over the entire area of a tennis court. But enteropathy, a damaged intestinal lining due to inflammation and repair deficit that leads to a leakiness in, in between cells might have a surface area of 10% uh, uh, of, a, of a tennis court and would be allowing in digestive remnants that can be foreign and recognized by the body as invaders and the body then attacks the invaders. So here's a celiac case report. This is a person in midlife with recurrent chronic ills. They present lack of energy. They're taking in modest to moderate amounts of calories, but they're having trouble maintaining a healthier weight. They have too much fat and too little lean muscle. They don't have a positive past history, social history, family history. That's not the issue. The physical exam shows a well-developed individual with slight conjunctival pallor. Lab tests showed a mild anemia mild liver function transaminitis, which means elevation of liver function tests. Stools were negative for occult blood, and colonoscopy revealed a sigmoid polyp. Biopsies were taken. Person did the LRA by Elizak test. We asked them to substitute for the appropriate amount of time for their reactions, and we put them on a personalized plan to correct nutritional deficits and to evoke healing responses the alkaline way. Here you see a chart that we've developed. You want to eat 80% on the right. The more alkaline foods should be 80% of what you consume while you're recovering, and a little more than half, maybe 60%, to keep you healthy when you are healthy. Yes, you can have small amounts, 20% from the left when you're recovering, a little more after you've recovered. And so we did uh, some um, simply elegant and elegantly simple approaches to making the alkaline way accessible to people. And here we have a guide that you can download digitally. It's called The Joy in Living the Alkaline Way. It has information, inspiration, and um, access that allows you to eat more alkalinizing foods and stay well hydrated, to test your activity to make sure that you have enough motion in your day, and to check your first morning urine pH after rest. 
and to increase your magnesium with choline citrate if needed because that urine pH was too low, because choline citrate uniquely enhances the uptake and chaperones the delivery of magnesium. We also include experience and information about abdominal breathing, use of green dichromatic light and sunlight, how to eat in harmony with your nature and lifestyle, how to enhance locally grown, vine-ripened, organic, or biodynamic sources in your diet, how to make restorative sleep a priority through the use of salt and soda baths and meditation and, and deep breathing and other simple practices that over millennia have been validated, and how to work your muscles and relax in some balance and proportion. We want to restore balance. We think that's the alkaline way. We want to have a joy in living the alkaline way, um, as, as I've indicated. And we've now produced, I think, 15 different editions of this. Uh, so please take a look at it. And uh, we want it to save your life. Here's a particular case. 31-year-old woman um, diagnosed with ulcerative colitis. She did an over-the-counter cleanse that produced bloody stools. We don't recommend that. Past medical history included a large polyp removed from the intestines as an infant, and the mother has irritable bowel syndrome. This individual was put on Lialda without much benefit. And then they had a physician who recommended the LRA by ELISA Act test and plan. This individual out of 300 plus items tested reacted to just 18, and they were instructed by health coach on the phone how to substitute. So the implementation was to substitute for those immune reactors or that immune burden, supplement based on the health appraisal questionnaire, a multivitamin, essential omega-369 fatty acids, bone building nutrients, uh, recycled glutamine, comprehensive probiotic, uh, a, uh, because of mild anemia, an anemia building or ferrous aspartate complex, and then hydroxocobalamin and polyphenolics to evoke healing responses and healthy methylation. One and a half years later, after decades of suffering, CBC is now normal, hemoglobin is 12.9, CRP is 1.14, a little bit above what we want, but still really good. Ferritin is now low, or it had been high. Stays on acetyl, but reducing slowly from uh, six a day, she's now down to three a day. Weight is back up, so some of the enteropathy seems to be reversed. Amenorrhea, but breast tissue is coming back. Acupuncture once a month. Family is also healthier. Husband has lost weight. The kids are eating healthier too. And the plan is to repeat the LRA uh, so that uh, she can now take a second cycle of improving immune defense and repair while also uh, enhancing her nutritional resilience and, and functional competence. So inflammation, which is repair deficit, if you look to the left on the slide, you see it's related to arthritis, autoimmune disease, and diabetes. If you look diagonally to the upper left, it's related to all cardiovascular diseases. If you look straight up, it's related to cancer. How about to the right, pulmonary diseases? Or to the far right, neurologic diseases, prion diseases, and Alzheimer's? Kind of important so that you can enhance repair and not be stuck in the fire of inflammation. So the digestive microbiome is really related to conversion of food into energy. So we want you to eat what you can assimilate, utilize, and eliminate without immune burden. And I call attention to Soil and Your Health, a wonderful book by Beatrice Trom Hunter, one of the founders of the Nutrition for Optimal Health Association. And it was 40 years ago that B. Hunter asked NOHA, the predecessor to ANA, uh, to ask me to come to Chicago um, as a physician scientist uh, to talk about what we're talking about tonight. So I am very grateful to Beatrice from Hunter and all she did over her many decades uh, to inspire folks like me. There's also a simple self-assessment for transit time. It uses activated charcoal capsules, two capsules for every 50 pounds of weight. So for most people, it's six to 12 capsules with a glass of water. You take it between meals and you record the time. Healthy transit time is 12 to 18 hours. So what you eat at night should come out in the morning. Usual American transit time is now three to seven days. So even people who are regular today 
may be eliminating what they took in a week ago. And that's enough time for problems to occur, including recirculation of toxins um, and many other evidences of underlying, although often invisible, digestive disorder. In regard to transit time, average is 36 to 96 hours, healthy is 12 to 18 hours. Less than 12 hours might mean a short bowel syndrome, and we can consult about that. Uh, but we do now know that the healthy transit remains 12 to 18 hours, and very few Americans are healthy in regard to their digestive confidence in transit. So as we said, we want to use the activated charcoal. You could use beets or corn, but we much prefer the Requa charcoal. Uh, this is, of course, dioxin-free. Uh, if you're less than 150 pounds, maybe six caps. If you're 150 to 200 pounds, eight caps. If you're 200 to 250 pounds, 10 caps. More than 250 pounds, 12 caps. So we want you to get enough healthy prebiotic, probiotic, and symbiotics. Prebiotic fiber, probiotic live bugs, and symbiotic recycled glutamine so that you can energize and repair your gut. Then we want you to have lots of soluble fiber because it dissolves in water to form a gel-like material that toxins bind to. It lowers blood cholesterol. It lowers blood glucose. It improves transit. And insoluble fiber is what allows your, your peristalsis, your contraction of the smooth muscle of the intestine, uh, to get uh, the uh, toxic residues out. And here you see a slide that I'm going to let you look at for a moment of all the many effects of probiotics. Beneficial effects on the immune system and metabolism, beneficial effects on the in intestinal microbiota, intest uh, many beneficial effects. And very few harmful effects as long as you're taking in healthy probiotic organisms that are alive and in adequate amounts. And remember, for prebiotics, it's 40 to 100 grams a day. For probiotics, it's 40 to 100 billion organisms a day. And then the recycled glutamine um, in order to energize uh, and improve the competence of digestion, energize repair and improve the competence of digestion. Now, in regard to the healthy flora, we suggest 10 active strains in your probiotics, including multiple lactobacillus species, multiple bifidobacterium species, and streptomophilus or strep infantis. Um, uh, and we suggest that organisms uh, that favor humans are best for human uh, probiotic uh, consumption. In regard to the microbiome and GI essentials, we want safer repair and energy. We want recycled glutamine with pyridoxal alpha-ketoglutarate pack, something we pioneered. So you get all the benefit of, of glutamine uh, for energy and no chance of glutamate buildup. This energizes gut repair, improves digestion, and shall I say again, never builds up glutamate because you're preventing glutamate buildup by recycling the glutamine 10 times with the help of pyridoxal alpha-ketoglutarate pack. In regard to medications, maldigestion, and food reactions, um, if you want to know what pr promotes most of the maldigestion in America, it's consumption of COX-2 uh, NSAID type painkillers that prevent repair. Antibiotics that killed off healthy bugs with unhealthy bugs. Histamine antagonists and proton pump inhibitors that reduce stomach acid, impair B12 and magnesium mineral uptake. Medicines like metformin that promotes B12 deficiency. All of these promote maldigestion and dysbiosis that are very commonly used in clinical medicine today. And rarely uh, does the consumer or even the clinician understand the consequences uh, that we're talking about. What we want is pro-repair, additional nutrients that are pro-repair, enhance repair. So we want you to take in ascorbate based on a personal C-cleanse. We want this to be 100% L-ascorbate, fully buffered and fully reduced. Then we want superfoods because they're rich in polyphenolics. And if you don't get enough of the superfoods and fruits, then you can take the polyphenolics and supplements. We want to have B complex so that methylation occurs efficiently. We want to engage biological detoxification 
because we are marinating in a sea of toxins, the question is, what are we going to do about it? Then we want the high sulfur foods to be staples in our diet. G-G-O-B-E is the acronym. That stands for garlic, ginger, onions, brassica sprouts, like broccoli sprouts, and eggs. One or more should be a staple in the diet, not a condiment, a staple. And then finally, we want butyrates, and we want omega-3, EPA, DHA, uh, so that we can rebalance from the environmental challenges of today. We want pure, less contaminated, mycelized essential fats and other digestive uh, energy sources. So there are eight predictive biomarker tests, and I'd like to briefly review them. Starting in the upper left, you see the green hemoglobin A1C, and it should be less than 5%. And going around clockwise, we then get to high-sensitivity C-reactive protein and the best outcome or healthiest value is less than 0.5. In regard to homocysteine, it's important in methylation and detoxification and sulfur metabolism, and you want your homocysteine less than 6. Continuing around clockwise, you get to the HS, the high-sensitivity lymphocyte response assay, uh, to measure immune tolerance or intolerance. And again, continuing clockwise, you get the first morning urine pH, a measure of cell acidosis and the need for minerals like magnesium and zinc. Then you get to vitamin D, where the 25-hydroxy-D is the correct measurement to make, and the healthy people have the 50 to 80 value. Continuing around clockwise, we have just two more to do, omega-3 index, a measure of your omega-3 to omega-6 fats in your membranes, and then 8-oxoguanine, uh, one that may be less familiar, but it's a measure of oxidative stress and distress in the nucleus, and we think that is an important urine-based test, uh, inexpensive, but additionally helpful in terms of do you need more antioxidant and mineral protection uh, in your DNA. So just to review what we've gone over, the first four of these predictive biomarker tests are hemoglobin A1C. This has to do with sugar, ins insulin, and energy conversion. Also has to do with age-related glycation end products. If you're concerned about that, you want a hemoglobin A1C of less than 5% so that the, the age-related glycation end products uh, are recycled by a healthy immune defense and repair uh, system, an innate immune system. Next is the high-sensitivity C-reactive protein. This is about repair, inflammation, and immune uh, burdens. Uh, healthy people have less than 0.5 uh, milligrams per liter. Uh, the high-sensitivity C-reactive, uh, sorry, the high-sensitivity homocysteine is about detoxification, epigenetic control, and methylation, and healthy people have less than 6 micromoles per liter. The HSLRA is the lymphocyte response site. This is test of immune memory and rare tolerance. And healthy people have no delayed reactions, uh, whereas many people with autoimmunity or with chronic illness uh, have reactions. Uh, and those reactions need to be identified comprehensively so that people can substitute for a period of time. If we want to look at the other four predictive biomarkers, to quickly review them, they are first morning urine pH, gives you a measure of acid alkaline status after rest. Goal range is 6.5 to 7.5. Vitamin D, you want the 25-hydroxycholecalciferol, the 25-hydroxy-D. Goal range is 50 to 80 nanograms per ml. Omega-3 index, that, that balance of omega-3 to omega-6 uh, fats in the membranes, with more than 8% being a healthy omega-3 index, indicating enough omega-3 and not too much omega-6. And then 8-oxoguanine, that measure of oxidative stress and antioxidant need in the nucleus, with a goal being less than 5 nanograms per milligram of creatinine. So in sum, we want a healthy immune system that defends us and repairs us. We want to use predictive high-sensitivity assessments, self-assessments, and then predictive biomarker tests to determine where a person is, strength, is strong and resilient and healthy, you should celebrate that, and where they're at risk, where they are sacrificing both their future and their current quality of life. So living the alkaline way and using personalized antioxidant supplements that are supportive uh, is key for adequate repair and immune system function. 
And what we briefly talked about in the last few minutes has to do with functional, the new emerging functional immunology. So we can determine the harmful from the helpful responses, but only with functional cell cultures. We can distinguish inflammation and understand it more deeply as repair deficits. We can even manage people who have gluten, celiac, or other maldigestion issues. We can use delayed allergies in a true ex vivo lymphocyte cell culture to distinguish helpful from harmful responses. And then we can have a lifestyle program about what people eat, drink, think, and do so that they can restore their health, that they can restore their vitality, their resilience, systematically and intentionally. So we rethink health at the Health Science Collegium. This has been a brief overview of functional immunology, the microbiome, and metabolism. And if you have a question or two or three, uh, it would be my pleasure uh, to address them. Thank you so much, Dr. Jaffe. What a wonderful presentation. And thank you for agreeing to um, take a few previously submitted questions. So uh, the first is, can you explain the difference between intolerance and delayed hypersensitivity? Very good question. What's the difference between intolerance and hypersensitivity? Well, let's say that you eat more food than your stomach acid can begin to pre-digest, and therefore what comes into the intestines is partially digested but uh, impaired um, product of stomach digestion. It's called the chyme. That's intolerance. That means your uh, habits of eating are not in harmony with your digestive competence. On the other hand, hypersensitivity means that digestive remnants that are immune active have gotten across the surface of your intestines into your body, and the gut nervous system, which is half of your body's uh, immune defense and repair system, has recognized the foreign invader and mounted a delayed allergy lymphocyte B or T cell response. So they're both about digestion, but they're very different. One has to do with weak digestion that needs to be strengthened just by choosing uh, foods lower on the food chain that can be fully digested to their building blocks and not partially digested to things that become immune burdensome. And by the way, if you take acid blockers or medicines for reflux or metformin for diabetes, as I indicated in the presentation, these are very good ways to create maldigestion on top of intolerance. Very interesting, doctor. Uh, next question is, how does one achieve and maintain a healthy acid-alkaline balance? Well, yes, you achieve a healthy acid-alkaline balance by measuring after rest your urine pH. There's one time a day when the urine has equilibrated with the cells that line the bladder, and after six hours of rest, and you can go to the bathroom, but you can't go to the kitchen, you can't be physically active, you have to kind of mostly rest for those six hours, that urine reflects your magnesium cellular mineral status. And if it's below 6.5, you need more magnesium, and you need it to be enhanced with choline citrate, because choline citrate uniquely can enhance the uptake and chaperone delivery of the magnesium to the cells that are hungry for it, and now your urine pH will be 6.5 to 7.5, your restorative sleep will be better, your endurance will be better, your digestive competence will be better, and your fats won't be damaged because it turns out magnesium protects fats in transit, and so magnesium deficiency, which is very common, and classically magnesium has been very hard to get in and would run out as fast as you got it in. So we paid attention to that, and we have enhanced the uptake of fully ionized magnesium with choline citrate, and in the last 20 years, we have been able to help people get out of metabolic cellular acidosis for the first time. That's, that's excellent, um, and it looks like we have time for one more question, Dr. Jaffe. Mm -hmm. So what are some other tests of hypersensitivity, and how do they compare with, say, a lymphocyte response assay? Thanks for asking, because the lymphocyte response assay, at least the one that we recommend, is ex vivo. 
So here you're getting information about the immune defense and repair system just as it happens in the body, but under the control conditions of the laboratory. And then we've been able to show over decades less than 3% variance on blind split samples. So our cell culture, because of the way it's done and its uniqueness, is more precise even than the confusing antibody tests or particle size tests or cytokine release tests. So there are many test tube based in vitro tests. I will measure your IgG antibody, or I will measure your particles and see if they change in size, or I will measure some mediated release of some cytokine fatty acid derived chemical. All of those are in vitro test tube based and confusing because they're not, the results do not clearly distinguish helpful from harmful. In contrast, the ex vivo LRA by ELISA Act uniquely identifies all the harmful antibodies, IgA, IgM, IgG, and immune complexes, and picks up the T cells that react directly even without antibody. So that's what we do recommend. And we do not recommend the older generations of physical chemistry that frankly are confusing. And by the way, in addition to being confusing, People who have studied blind split samples of those other methods find that there's big variance just sending in the same, a sample from the same person without telling the lab that it's the same person, and they come back with 20, 30, 40 percent different results. Very interesting, Dr. Jaffe. Unfortunately, our time is up. Uh, I, I do wish we had more time. What an incredibly interesting topic, and thank you so much for that. Um, so this has just been, as always with you, sir, an enlightening evening, and we invite our audience to learn more about your work at drrusselljaffe.com. So let me just say good night and best of health to you all. And to everyone. Thanks so much for the opportunity.